mention that later this fall, we have other poets visiting, Ada Lamone, Genevieve Kaplan, they're both visiting, and also we'll have an MFA poetry reading, so student reading. Um, in addition, uh, a visit, a special lecture in this room by Presidential Fellow Carolyn Forche is scheduled for December 6th. So I believe that's a Wednesday. Mark your calendars for that. That's just been added and we're working out the details. Take out your phone. And in addition to, to marking your calendar for the rest of Tabula Poetica, uh, silence your cell phones. If you want to tweet or Facebook that you're here having a great time <laughs> as you're doing that, that's fine with me. Uh, most of the support for the visiting poets and for the International Journal Tab comes from the English department. I especially want to thank our department chair, Dr. Joanna Levin. Many of you know her. In addition, I want to thank our administrative assistants, Kristen Laxo and David Krausman. They've done a fantastic job um, coordinating these kinds of logistics. And also, a shout out to Esther Shin, who is at the back of the room, and she's the library coordinator for events. Leatherby Libraries, where we are now, Fish Interfaith Center, and poets and writers continue to support our talks and readings for Tabula Poetica. I am now going to introduce the poets. This is the moment you've all been waiting for. Uh, Katie Manning holds a PhD from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette and an MA from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. In addition to her book, Taste the Other, how many of you have Taste the Other? Awesome. Um, in addition to this book, she's the author of four poetry chapbooks. We have copies of this book and also one of the chapbooks at the back of the room for purchase. So if you are interested in purchasing a book, come on back after the reading. Katie Manning is a brave poet in all sorts of ways, both personally and professionally. One of her ongoing projects is to take language from the Bible out of context to make art instead of using it to attack each other. Her latest poem publication, I think, she may have published something since this, her latest poem publication is about a massacre in Nigeria, and the poem appears not in a literary journal, but in the American Journal of Nursing, which I think is fantastic. Katie Manning is unafraid to explore what poetry can accomplish in this world and where it can accomplish things. As a poetry nerd myself, I especially appreciate what the book Taste the Other does with form and what one reviewer called an imaginative wit. Its eight sections are premised on the eight word statement, once upon a time there was a mother, with each word in turn in that statement footnoted section by section. So it's hard to explain how this book works, but you pick it up and you start thumbing through the sections and you there's a little light bulb that goes off over your head and says, I've never seen anything quite like this before, but I get it. There are many other kinds of repetition that become refocusing and reinvention as well, as the poems explore what it means to be a mother, both in reality and in the author's sometimes nightmarish dreams. The alphabetically driven poem drawn from the index of what to expect when you're expecting is playful, haunting and full of the unexpected. In this book, hiccups are a kind of love. Eyes become mirrors to capture ourselves. People say things to try to make them true. Statues come to life and fairy tale mothers wish they could sleep for a while. It's a tour de force of the maternal as well as the poetic. Please welcome Katie Manning. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm so pleased to be here, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I thought that I would start with a couple of unattached poems, um, and part of this is just to gauge my audience. So, um, <laughs> so how many of you love Ezra Pound? How many of you hate Ezra Pound? How many of you love to hate Ezra Pound? <laughs> Okay, so, <laughs> me too. Um, so this poem um, is, is kind of a, a playful interaction with Ezra Pound. I took a course 
um, that was all focused on Ezra Pound in grad school. And so I, I just had to deal with him. And he has a poem called The Tea Shop, where he basically is kind of checking out this woman in the tea shop who's serving him tea. And he's thinking, you know, she's going to, she's going to become middle-aged. Um, and so this was my response. So, Tea with Ezra. He told me that only he and Whitman had gained immortality, and he took a bite of his lemon pound cake. I reminded him that he'd already been dead 30 years. <laughs> I tried not to stare through his decaying jaw at the jostled pastry. He looked me up and down and said, yes, you also will turn middle-aged. I simply shut his book and drank his tea when I'd finished mine. <laughs> So you're welcome to laugh and you're welcome to talk back to me if you want. It's customary at a poetry reading not to clap between the poems, but you can do whatever you want. Um, so uh, the next poem I wasn't going to read, but I decided after conversation with Richard at dinner that I was going to go ahead and go for it. So this poem has an epigraph, a book tightly shut is but a block of paper, which is a Chinese proverb. And I like to think of it as my attempt at an inaugural poem. Rise and Fall. Little D didn't even realize that books could open. He stacked them like blocks, building the tower that he planned to live in someday. He'd sit on top and look down upon Lego people and think of how much better he was than them, how like a god he must seem with his height and power. But each time, he'd lean too far or wiggle too much, and the tower would topple him down. No matter how much he shouted at them, the people on the ground could not stop smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So um, the next few poems that I'm going to read for you are from a chapbook collection called The Gospel of the Bleeding Woman. Um, and it's a chapbook that pretends like it's a full-length book. Um, it, I, I did a lot of research for this book. I became sort of fascinated by the bleeding woman who's mentioned in three of the gospel accounts. Um, she doesn't have a name and it's not really her story. She just sort of interrupts Jesus on his way to heal somebody else. Um, and I was always fascinated by her. I had grown up in the church and I had, I had been a Bible quizzer in my youth. Um, so, so I was very familiar with the text. Um, and so I, I did the sort of research that was sometimes academic and sometimes it had me doing Wikipedia searches and um, it, was, it was kind of all over the place and then I mixed it all up and wrote whatever I wanted. So <laughs> it's the beautiful thing about poetry. So, um, so I'm going to read through some of these poems and occasionally I'll comment a bit, but it's kind of a chronological look at this character um, who I was tracing in her own historical moment and then she kind of leapt out and got a bit, be she got out of my control, which is good, good for her. So this is from the Gospel of the Bleeding Woman. First Blood. Just dawn, the warmth wakes me. I feel wet and ashamed, but then I know. I bolt up, look down at the cloth. A dark tide pool spreads out from the center. A red sun rises where life begins. Seven weeks later. The tears won't flow from my face the way blood flows from my womb. The current continues daily down my legs, though I have begged the God whose temple I may not enter to sew me closed. Once, they say, he turned an Egyptian sea to blood and back to water. I don't believe this now. The blood remains and never turns. My tide moves ever out and out. The doctors advise. This is a, I, I probably, I'm just going to show you. It's kind of a three voice poem. So the voices end up layering together. Um, the doctors advise. She has, she is, she miscarried, a leaking heart, an abnormality, a demon. She must have, she could have, she has sinned, touched herself, eaten unclean meat. Bleed her arms each day, kill one goat a week. At the next full moon, float face down in the center of the sea. So a lot of the work on the, the bleeding woman, a lot of the sort of speculation um, revolves around her being an older woman who was hemorrhaging. Um, and I thought it was much more fascinating to imagine her as a younger woman. And part of that is because I had always imagined her as a younger woman um, because Jesus calls her daughter. And for me, that, that just was where my, my mind went. So that was how I imagined her. 
Um, I do give her a name, which is Nura, and it means light. Um, and this is the title poem, The Gospel of the Bleeding Woman. I touched his cloak. This much is certain. Suddenly I had no name. Suddenly I inhabited a body split in three. I had been blood subject for 12 years. I had seen doctors. One time doctors didn't exist. One time my voice didn't exist. Other times I heard voices in my head. Then I touched his white cloak. I explained myself. He knew without asking. Always he called me daughter, 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 and said, your faith has healed you. Then he said, go in peace. Then he said, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Then he said nothing and walked off to find a dead girl. I touched his cloak. Suddenly I was alone. Suddenly I didn't exist. I walked home in a trance and fell asleep with my sandals on. I didn't wake up in time to see how our stories would end. So then things get weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is the resurrection of Nora. Just dawn. The noise wakes me. I wonder why I'm wearing sandals and how I know the word clock. I bolt up, look out the window. Yellow cars scream on the street below. Yellow leaves fill the park. Then I remember he told me, your faith has healed you. My temples throb and I think, what faith? So I'm going to read you one more poem from this collection. Um, she ends up in New York City because I, I really resisted that, but I, I couldn't resist, and it kept coming up. And so I wrote it and decided to just see what happened. Um, so this is when she gets to meet Jesus again, um, this time in New York City, where death is not and is. I met Jesus the next day at the Life Cafe. Call me Jay now, he said. People lock me up when I say I am God. He pulled back his sleeves to show the marks on his arms from recent shots. I asked what I could do. Just lie low, he said, between bites of falafel. Dead is the way the world wants us. People hate to feel alive. We ate in silence for a while. Then I asked, what happens to us? He wiped his young hands and stood to leave. We are finished, and kissed my cheek. I put my hand on his arm and told him the scars would be beautiful when they healed. Thanks. So um, to switch gears now, um, I'm going to read a bit from Tasty Other. Um, and that is my collection that is um, a full-length collection. It was published in November. And I like to describe it as exploring all of the wonder and terror of becoming a mother. Um, and so uh, I'm going to jump in with a couple of the anxiety dream inspired poems. The first one is The Minor Mutation. You know babies change in the womb, from tadpole to gerbil to tiny human. Somehow, yours kept changing. Look at the screen. See the lengthened neck, lengthened legs, hardening hooves. <laughs> Sometimes these things happen. <laughs> the good news is your baby is healthy. It won't come out for an extra year and three months, so you can enjoy pregnancy even more. <laughs> the bad news is that your newborn will be at least five feet tall. When you go into labor, you will need to stand on a high place and let your baby ease its long way out, <laughs> fall hard to the floor, leave your body completely empty. <laughs> I love your laugh. Thank you. <laughs> Um, a couple more of those. The Birth of Jazz. This one is, I'm just going to like flash you my pages here. This one's shaped a bit like that on the page. The Birth of Jazz. The baby emerges, sparkling, covered in sequins, shining in sequins like a disco ball. I never knew I had such things inside me. Ella's glittering gown at the blue room. Maybe baby's high notes will break glass, but baby smiles and giggles crying impossible. And I'm going to read one straight out of here. I try not to flip too much in my book when I'm reading. This takes some time. Um, but since I'm on a college campus and since I have a couple of Point Loma alumni in the room, um, this is a poem that is set on my college campus. The Stolen Egg. My husband and I run across our college campus, staying in the shadows of guard shacks and chapels. On the brick lane beside the cafeteria, the T-Rex crushes alumni names to anonymous dust. He's looking for us. 
We slip into the English building, crouch in the inner corridor. I take out the large egg I've concealed in my backpack, and we watch our sun hatch quietly in the dark. So the next poem I'll share with you is actually the first poem in the book. Um, and a couple of things that I like to share with people about it. Um, one is that it responds to those pregnancy calendars that are like, this week your baby is the size of an orange, and this week it's the size of a watermelon. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the other is, <laughs> it feels like it. So, um, so the other fun bit of information to know about it is that the line by line syllable count follows the Fibonacci sequence. So if you like math, enjoy that. And if you don't, just pretend I didn't say that. And <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to know that, but it's kind of a fun thing to know. So this is called Week by Week. At this time, your offspring is invisible. Now a speck, the dream of seed and root. Baby is a dime, quarter, increasing in value. Golf ball, gerbil, your own palm. Then more sports equipment, softball, football, racquetball court. <laughs> By this point, your baby is a train, a field, a city, an ocean. This week, baby is the sky, now a hemisphere, now a blurry world. And one of the things that I love to do, um, as you might have noticed with the Gospel of the Bleeding Woman, is to explore characters um, who maybe don't get their own story or their own name. Um, and so I really love to respond to fairy tales as well. And this one is perhaps a, a perspective that's a little more, um, maybe a little more explored. But I, I was really fascinated by the idea of Wendy from Peter Pan as a mother. She's a fascinating mother figure, um, being a little girl herself. So this poem is called Wendy Lady. My children are almost my age. When I fly, they believe I am a bird. They built a house just for me, but I still visit them underground in the sky. At night, I tuck them into my stories. I arrange them all neatly with mermaids and pirates, where they are always about to die, where they are safe from growing up. I leave the windows open so they can escape. I leave the windows open to catch them. And this one is one of my favorites. I don't know, I'm not supposed to have favorites, but it's one of my favorites. Um, so this is Sleeping Beauty's Mother. And I was reading the Charles Perrault version of Sleeping Beauty and started thinking about her mother. So Sleeping Beauty's Mother. A king and a queen wanted to have children. They tried everything, travel to drink the waters of the world, vows of silence, solitude, and celibacy, pilgrimages to trendy shrines, prayers to various gods and goddesses, and nothing worked. Finally, they tried sex. <laughs> the queen became pregnant. The king chased after fairies. Seven fairy godmothers came to give the baby gifts, though the king didn't bring the oldest fairy in the land, so she brought herself and a curse to the shower. The girl will prick her finger with a spindle and die. No, said the last young fairy. The girl will only sleep for 100 years, and she'll wake to a prince's kiss. Everyone loved the lovely young fairy, and everyone felt sorry for the little baby doll. The king passed anti-spindle laws, and the queen, tired of swollen breasts, sleepless nights, a king who was too friendly with fairies, thought of a century of sleep and a new young prince, and wished she had her daughters good luck. <laughs> So the next poem I'm going to read for you is, um, it's in 10 short pieces. Um, and when I was living in southern Louisiana, it was a very Catholic place to be. And right down the street from where I lived was um, a kind of slightly larger than life-sized statue of Mary in someone's front yard. Like it wasn't, it was just a house and their front yard, giant statue of Mary. And I became really fascinated by the statue of Mary. So I have like, I snuck pictures of it a couple times. And, um, and so, so that, uh, of course, I had to deal with Mary when I was working with motherhood and living in Southern Louisiana, um, because she is that, you know, wonderful paradox, both virgin and mother. So this is Mother Mary comes to be. When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, only a passing pigeon saw the plastic melt to cotton and flesh and take a breath. The bird winked and wavered in the humid air. Mary smiled. She'd wanted to come back to Earth for a while. 
When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, a pigeon flew by as the acting dove, but no voice came from heaven. What could such a voice say? This is my daughter, this is my mother, this my creation, my co-creator. At last on the breeze, Mary heard, this is my, whom I love. When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, no one noticed. Mary was slightly disappointed. For years, people had seen her face in stained cloth, stuccoed walls, and molded yogurt, but people always did miss the obvious. When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, she stretched her limbs, rearranged her blue and white robes. Some boys driving past in a rusted truck honked and whistled. Mary laughed. It felt good to have a young body again. When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, she was already tired of being called virgin. She'd had more kids after Jesus, you know. And Joseph knew well that she was no virgin anymore. Sometimes she had even felt sexy. <laughs> when the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, she just wanted to try ice cream. She still had a little plastic up her sleeve, so she strolled down to Borden's parlor to buy a cone of fudge swirl, and it was good. <laughs> When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, she watched humans turn the Gulf of Mexico from water to crude oil. She wasn't impressed. She might be a biased mother, but wine was much better as a party trick, in her opinion. <laughs> when the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, she watched grown men fight over plastic necklaces, coins, and cups. Avoiding drunken elbows, she picked up a strand of golden beads at her feet, hung them from her neck, and walked off to find one last bite of meat. When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, she hailed a cab and went to Mass to hail herself, sat in the back <laughs> row, and wept to see the cross. That boy had been the hardest to let go and the hardest to let in. Mary snuck out before they broke her son again. When the statue of Mary on Johnston Street first came to life, she took a breath because she could. And when she'd had enough of air and flesh for another lifetime, she stepped back onto the grass, stood straight, and stretched her arms before her, palms raised. Mary sighed and left her image where she'd found it, by the side of the road. All right, now that we're all friends, I'm going to bring you right into the delivery room. <laughs> so um, I really love Mina Loy. She was a modernist poet. Um, she was. Uh, she was wonderful. She, she did some strange and amazing things. Um, and one of her poems is called Parturition, and it's this sort of stream of consciousness um, capturing of her experience of labor and delivery. Um, and there were a couple of bits of that that were running through my head while I was in labor with my first son. Um, and one of the, one of the sections was, um, Mother I am, identical with infinite maternity. And the other was, I am the center of a circle of pain. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I just had those swirling around. So, um, so after I had my first son and had a little bit of distance, I decided that I should probably attempt my own parturition poem. So this is parturition. My veins roll away. The back of my hand swells black with blood. The soles of my feet hold each other. I am waiting on a cliff over the ocean. Breathe. Breathe, I taste the salt. The me in the room is not me. I blow out candles, blow the candles, blow. No, I am just a child, a big breath before a bright red birthday cake. I can't let go. The next one is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The head in the mirror is not mine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Someone has set me on fire. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Everything falls. I'm inside out. Open my eyes. Wet red life wriggles on my belly. Mouth open, eyes closed. It must be crying, but I only hear my own voice. Oh my, oh my. My husband avoids sharp objects near soft skin. The baby is weighed, measured, inked, placed in a glass bowl, sewn back together with blood and twine, I become something new. So that's the last poem I'm going to read to you from Tasty Other. Um, and then I'm just going to close with one
that's fairly new. Um, and as I admitted at the poetry talk earlier, I often don't read things that are very new, um, partially because whatever Anna said about me being brave, I'm not sure I'm brave enough usually to, to do the new stuff. Um, but I thought it was kind of fun since, um, since Tasty Other is dealing with my first pregnancy and that transition to motherhood, to give you a poem that is, is definitely swirling around the idea of motherhood, but much more recently, um, my oldest son is five, and he just lost his first uh, two teeth now, and so this poem is called Love Poem with Teeth. What would you do with it, you ask? I would keep it hidden in my jewelry box like a witch collecting body parts for a spell, I think. <laughs> then I go ahead and say that out loud. <laughs> You laugh and look like you don't believe I'm serious. Later, when we've waited for our son to be deep in dreams, we sneak into our own bedroom, you shining a screen light across our firstborn, tucked into the sleeping bag where he begged to be on this special night. We negotiate in whispers, a two-headed fairy too new to the job to be suave, because we both want to make the exchange. I lie beside our son, slip the Ziploc bag from under his pillow, slowly si slide a dollar into its place. We make our escape. At the kitchen counter, we stand side by side and examine his tooth, its surprising long roots. I hand it to you and say, you'll have to make it disappear. I resign myself to its loss. A few minutes later, you return to me, chin down, cheeks pink, and say, I can't bring myself to throw it out. I laugh and we kiss. And I know I'll sneak upstairs again, conceal this little bit of our child in a locket to keep safe. You gently place our first baby's first baby tooth in my open palm, like the token of love it is. Thank you. All right, and I... I'll answer almost anything, so... <laughs> Who has a good question? About the poems or about writing? I'm watching my students. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that inspires questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I am often shocked when I read something and people laugh. Um, so that's, that's been a learning experience for me that I, when, I, when I first read a poem. Um, so I haven't read this poem, the last poem that I read, I hadn't read it to an audience yet. Um, that, was, that was the first time. So I'm pleased that you laughed. I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't sure, I, I don't. Um, yeah, I think, I think I have a playfulness when I write, but I'm not necessarily aiming at humor. Um, but then sometimes the humor is there, and I'm grateful for it when it comes. Did, yeah. Have you ever had an audience that just doesn't laugh at all, or, or is it pretty consistent? I have, you know, every now and then um, I've noticed audiences will laugh in different places. So I think especially with the motherhood poetry, there are places where women who have given birth will laugh harder and louder <laughs> and sometimes you know depending on on the crowd different parts will get a, a different response yeah can you talk a little bit about the structure of taste the other and whether you came up with that like before you embarked on it as a project or whether you had some poems and recognized something yeah, I talked about this a little bit earlier in the class meeting um, that I got to visit, but um, so originally Tasty Other was a, a creative, it was the creative portion of my dissertation, and it was very differently structured um, when, I, when I first created it. And I didn't have a structure in mind, I was just sort of writing anything, um, you know, in response to stuff I was reading about mothers and motherhood, strange mother stories, obscure mother characters, my own experiences, um, and especially the anxiety dreams, but I wasn't sure exactly how it was going to shake out. Um, and organizing a collection is just the worst. It's, <laughs> it is really hard um, to, to do it. 
And so I was really fortunate um, that one of the one of the presses that I submitted to that sent me a really encouraging decline um, had said, you know, this was in our final round, and here's what we really loved about it, and here was, is what wasn't working as well for us. Um, and one of the things that they mentioned was the order of the poems. Um, and that editor said, you know, just a suggestion that you might try. Um, what if you used that footnoted poem to structure the book? And my first thought was, whatever, I'm not going to do that, right? Um, and, and then I let that sit for a bit until it wasn't painful. And then I looked at that feedback again and went, OK, what if I try that? And I tried it. Um, using so it, so it's a poem. Um, it's actually in nine parts because the comma is also footnoted. <laughs> so um, so it's a it's a nine it's a poem that happens in a sentence, but then really the poem happens in these nine footnotes, and so um, so those are are then broken apart, and each footnote became a section heading for the book, um, and so then I structured the poems hopefully in a way that made sense with each of those footnotes and sort of chronologically with pregnancy um, and childbirth and just after. So, so yeah, it was um, the good fortune that I, that I took some critical feedback um, and decided to try revising with it. And then it did feel like the book kind of clicked into place once I played with that arrangement. So, and then it ended up being, um, I submitted it to, to a few different contests, and the first one that I had sent it to after that restructuring um, is the one that, that took it. Um, so, so it apparently worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you start with just a poem, and then, it, then you like the feeling of that poem, and then you start creating a whole book about it, or do you come first with an idea of so it, it's happened to me both ways. Um, so I, I used to, you know, especially when I started writing more seriously, it was just, you know, here's a poem, here's a poem, here's a poem, and I wasn't thinking at all about kind of an overall collection. Um, and then with the Gospel of the Bleeding Woman, that was definitely a choice of like, I am going to do this research and read everything I can about this, this character, no matter how ridiculous. I'm just going to read everything um, and kind of, you know, shake it all up and, and see what happens and play with that material. Um, so that I, I definitely chose before I started working on a poem. Um, with Tasty Other, I was really resistant. I started writing poems that, that related to babies and motherhood, and I wasn't pregnant yet. Um, we had decided that we were going to, you know, try for some kids. And, but I, you know, obviously I was preoccupied with, like, babies. Um, <laughs> and also very anxious about it, because I started having these crazy dreams even right before I, I got pregnant with our first son. Um, and so, yeah, I, I resisted it for a while. This is kind of the story, this is going to be the story of my poetic life. Like, I resisted it for a while. I was like, no, I don't want to write about that. And then that's just <laughs> where I kept being drawn. And so, I mean, I think it's been a series of discovering that if I'm preoccupied with something, I should probably let it feed my poems instead of fighting against it. Yeah. 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 Heidi. Hey, Oh, you no. Keep wanting to write <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Every now and then, there's a rare, rare occasion where I'll, I'll work on a poem the first time and feel like, yes, um, that just doesn't happen most of the time. Um, and I, I feel like I'm probably the worst judge of my own poetry. So um, I was at a, a writing workshop at the beginning of August, and we were writing poems each day and then bringing them and reading them the next morning. And so I, I had written a poem, and I just thought, man, this isn't working. And I kept you know, trying to work on it and work on it the night before. And I finally was just like, whatever. I'm going to bring it to class. They know. They know it was just written in a night. It's, you know, it'll be fine. So I read it, and the response in the room was kind of a, ooh. And then and Carolyn Forche was the workshop leader. Um, and she said, would you read that again? <laughs> and I was just like. Yes. <laughs> and, and yeah, it was, it was just such a wonderful, like, wow, I didn't realize what the poem was doing. Um, and so, and something I said to Mike earlier when we did a podcast recording was that, you know, I think that 
that poems always invite readers to participate in the poem, right? There are the gaps that you fill in with your own associations with the words or with the content, you know, whatever it is, you're always participating in creating the poem as you read it. Um, and so I think, I think sometimes that's why I'm a bad reader of my own poems, because I have this sort of fixed idea of what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do. Um, and it helps me to hear how readers or you know, listeners are, are taking the poem and what they're doing with it, I guess. Is, yeah. is that how you decide when to send it out then? So how, how do you decide when it's finished enough to send out for possible publication? Yeah, I mean, it varies. Um, so, and, and part of that is, is sometimes just if I'm trying to complete a packet of poems, like, ooh, here, I have a couple of poems that I really want to send out, and I guess this one would work with those poems, so I'll throw that in there. Um, and every now and then, that extra one that I'm not too sure about is the one that ends up getting picked up. That actually just happened to me um, with St. Catherine Review. Um, Scott Cairns took a poem that was the poem that I kind of threw in at the last minute and went, I'm not, this is really new, and I'm not sure if this is finished, but I'm going to put it in there. And then that was one that he was like, yes this one. Um, so, so it's nice when that happens. I, I, I don't think I have to be certain necessarily before I try sending them out. Sometimes that actually helps me know, like, okay, I've sent this piece out a lot and it's, you know, nobody's biting, so maybe I should relook at it. Yeah. I feel like with your, with regards to your religious themes and symbolism and imagery, mm -hmm. um, there's this really, really for me, it was compelling the blend of, you know, I'm going to take this part of the narrative that I like and I'm going to maybe point out this part of the narrative that I maybe don't understand or agree with. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was done with a lot of sensitivity and a lot of, um, I don't know, I just thought it was a beautiful blend of I'm going to keep this, I'm going to postulate, you know, maybe this. Anyway, what kind of responses have you gotten from readers is what I'm curious about because you kind of do appropriate some narratives that are, you know, considered holy text. What kind yeah. of responses have you gotten from people? I think it probably helps that they're mine. They're my holy texts. So, so I'm not necessarily appropriating something that's someone else's. Um, but, you know, I, I am a Christian. I lead music at my church. I, you know, so, um, so I think, I think being in that community probably allows me to work with the texts um, in ways that are playful, but probably the way that I intend them. That there is still this reverence, even though there are you know, parts of, of the tradition or parts of the texts that have maybe been misused um, or, you know. So, so I think that's, that's probably how that tends to work. Um, when I, I, I read a poem once to an audience um, at a Christian university and I said, I'm a little nervous that this poem is heretical, but I'm gonna read it anyway. And I read it and afterward people were saying, I actually found that to be really reverent and you know really respectful, and I thought, huh, okay. So at my most heretical, I'm still somehow, <laughs> still somehow striking, you know, and and maybe I don't know, I don't know what's. Yeah, I just was so impressed with, like, I just I feel like there was unit, but there, I think that's the right word, reverence. You know, like there really was this like respect and, and sensitivity to the text. I mean, I just thought that was really. Yeah. And I mean, I, I guess I hope that it is being respectful of holy texts when we consider how they've been misused or consider the gaps that they have um, and, and try to think about them in ways that are, um, I don't know, in ways that are productive or in ways that might take us to, to different places. Yeah, so. Um, I have a question about form. Mm -hmm. um, you said earlier in our class that you write non fiction Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic question. I, I still ask that question. So um, I think, you know, also what I said in class about playing back and forth with, you know, putting things in prose or, or sometimes, you know, lineating them, maybe going back and forth. Um, there are definitely things that I have explored both in prose and in more lineated poetry. Um, I also said to the class that I lie to myself and say that I'm writing a poem, even if I'm writing something that I don't think is a poem, um, because I, that's how I can trick myself into writing nonfiction and fiction, if I imagine that it's all poetry, because that's, I think because that's just the genre that I feel the most comfortable with. 
Um, and I guess I hope that even when I am writing prose, I'm being very deliberate with my language and my word choice. Um, so yeah, I wish I had, I wish I had a coherent answer for that because I don't know, I guess, I guess maybe this is the distinction. When I feel like I have something that I want to say very clearly, like I want to make this argument, then for me, I'm going to do that in some kind of essay. Um, and when I want to explore something and I don't necessarily have an answer that I want to propose or I want to play some, with something and turn over those sorts of questions, then that's going to be poetry for me. Um, but I really love the blurry place between them. So I've been working with these prose poems that might be micro essays that are addressed to um, my granny who passed away a few years ago. And so I'm sort of talking to her and sometimes about her. And it's kind of this messy space that I like to imagine as kind of, I don't know, somewhere between poetry and prose. I do. How do some of your colleagues respond to just like a follow up on this religious, these religious texts? Like I know that you are a religious student yourself, but Point Loma is so Nazarene. <laughs> you know, it you know, seems like, like that outside of Point Loma, but <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. No, I mean, I have friends who went there, but like, yeah. How do they respond to it? Do they? Have you ever had someone that's like, well, this is just wildly like the the part about Mary being yeah. sexualized. No, I, I've had nothing but love, yeah. Um, and I actually, I had, I had a big book release party um, in, in November yeah. on campus, yeah. And um, my provost was there, and the dean of the School of Theology was there, and his mom's a poet. And um, yeah, I mean, one of my, one of my um, colleagues in theology was the one who was the best laugher at everything. He was like, you need one. You need one in the audience who's like holding down the laugh track. Um, so, so yeah, I've, I mean, I've. To her son, she's like, she's like, yeah, they turned water into oil, but maybe she's biased. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I've, I've only gotten encouragement from, from my colleagues. And I think, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I think because I incorporate a lot of research into my work also, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm playing with stories, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not being callous about it, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've never had any. Yeah, there's no mutilation of yeah. stories. Yeah, but, but we're, yeah. I, I'm always interested in how people perceive Point Loma from outside of Point Loma, so, <laughs> so that's fun too. We can, we can chat about that we'll some more later. later. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about yeah. Yeah. I wanted to disagree with you slightly. I think you read your poems very well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Almost to the extent that it feels as if it's been written for reading. Mm -hmm. but I, I find the structure of each poem almost. It's very finely structured. Like when mm -hmm. it reaches its end, it really feels like there's not much more to say. Oh, thank you. So that sense of an ending, almost a punchline. I think uh -huh. I love the last lines a lot of the time. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I that's I appreciate that. Yeah, I do. I do read aloud to myself a lot when I'm writing. Um, so especially as I'm revising. So I mean, I get something out and it's kind of messy, but then as I'm revising through it, I will read it over aloud a lot um, because I am interested in having, you know, the unity of sounds and um, and I want it to work off of the page as well as on. So. Richard. Thank you. Thank you. I don't blush often, but I might be <laughs> blushing. Often. Thank you both. Yeah. So I'll, I'll toss out one last question. Knowing that um, a lot of the audience are MFA students who have to do thesis projects, and some of them are poets, and some of them write other things. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever those other things <laughs> are. <laughs> when they don't want to explore. Uh. <laughs> I didn't mean that as a knock against fiction and nonfiction. <laughs> yeah. And I am only joking. I also write nonfiction. Um, what advice would you offer the, the MFA student, or what do you 
wish you had known or trusted or thought about when you were in graduate school? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think I gave you one of those, which was the, you might as well write the things that you are obsessed with. Mm -hmm. If something is preoccupying you, write it. You might as well. There's no reason to resist it, right? Um, and, and you don't know where it'll take you. And maybe it takes you in a place where you're like, okay, and I'm gonna put that away and that's fine. But it doesn't hurt you to write it out and see where it goes. Um, and you might be really pleasantly surprised. The other thing that was really useful to me when I was working on my thesis and my dissertation was that you just have to finish it enough to be finished right now. And that doesn't have to be the end of it forever. Um, so, so Tasty Other looks a lot different in its structure and it's got some poems swapped out. Um, that weren't in the, the creative portion of my dissertation. And so, um, so get it done, <laughs> get your thesis done, um, but then it'll have a life beyond the work, beyond the deadline. Um, and you might, not, you might not feel satisfied with it completely, but there's still time beyond that initial deadline and you can do more with it and do different things with it, but get it done. Just get it done, it'll be okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so yes, so how long, how long I, I finished um, my dissertation in 2012 um, and the Tasty Other won the 2016 Main Street Rag Book Award and was published in November. Which so. sounds quick to me. It did not feel quick, <laughs> 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 but it's, it's not bad. I've heard, I've heard of worse. But then there is the manuscript that I had before that I've been sending out that's gotten a couple of finalist nods and it's still just like simmering on the back burner. And so, I mean, that one's gonna have a much longer story um, if and when it ever is published in that manuscript form. So, yeah. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to unhook there. myself they now. Food, I think, back there. They charge us for those cans of soda, so <laughs> grab one even if you're not going to drink it now. Shake up the sugar on your See what PC does about it.